Welcome to Vintage Farmhouse Antiques and a video in which we're going to hopefully show you some of the techniques and tricks used by antiques appraisers and dealers in not just identifying a blue willow pattern date or the range of production but hopefully even the production facility or factory that produced it. Now these three platters all look very similar at first glance but in this video we're going to show you some of the subtle differences in the design, the shapes, the different elements that are included or not included in these blue willow transfer prints and how you can use those to try and identify as we say the date range and production facility. They all look very similar, you may have an unmarked piece of china, you want to know something about its value and its date range. We're going to show you how to do that and at the end of this video do stick around because we're going to reveal the actual real world value of each of these individual gorgeous antique meats platters. So let's get started, get yourself a cup of tea, let's start with platter number one and we're going to actually line some of these up in a series so we can point out some of the differences in the design, shape and variation of the blue willow pattern. So the first thing most people do in assessing a piece of uh, ironstone such as these is turn it over. And uh, what have we got on the reverse? Well, three wire racks, as you can see, all of them quite old looking, not ancient, ancient. You can see elements of this one are far older than a central piece that's been repaired sometime during the 19th century. But what are we looking for? Well, china marks, obviously stamp marks. Apparently on this one, not much to look at initially until you start looking very closely and just look what we've spotted there, a part impressed crown. Nothing else at first glance other than the number 11. Now quite often platters like this were made in graduated sets, so you will find numbers which refer to the uh, rough sizes or the number in the sequence. Platter number two. Thank goodness, at last, something with a mark on it. Now, China stamps or marks such as this in a variety of colours and designs are incredibly useful. Most factories produced a stamp for a relatively short period of time, and in the sort of 19th century, a short period of time could be anything up to 50 years. But they changed as legislation on imports, exports, taxation, etc., changed. So a stamp mark like this, incredibly useful and valuable in identifying the manufacturer. This one, as you can see, very nice and easy. And what we can do with that is use your phone and the AI built in using Google Lens to find a match on that. If it's got initials on it, and quite often the initials can be extremely well disguised as part of the design, but here we can clearly see SB and S. So a nice demarcated China mark. This platter also got a bit of emulsion on it and another impress mark. Again, sometimes uh, they used quite complex little coded shapes and designs to identify the year of manufacture. So do pay attention to those. And if you can get a good picture, again, Google Lens them or make reference back to the factory if you can identify that to see if you've got a set of uh, impress marks that will give you some clues as to the date of manufacture. And platter number three, again in an antique wire rack, very deep one this. Any marks on it? I'm going to have a really close look all over the surface and you do need to really inspect these very carefully as that first crown mark on platter number one showed. They weren't particularly good or skilled at making those impress marks very clear and quite often you'll get a partial mark but there's absolutely nothing on this one. But I'm just going to draw your attention to another thing. See how this china and the glaze used is quite whitish? Compare that to platter number two. See that bluish discoloration in it? And little bits of grit and soot in the actual glaze. Again, clues to its production and uh, the period of production. And platter number one, again, lots of inclusions in it, a lot of wear. The other thing to look at with these old platters, they should have some wear on the base plates where they've been sitting. The older they are, the more pronounced that uh, is going to be. It can be 
partially faked on uh, modern pieces, but that's usually a, a printed fake design rather than an actual way. You can feel this again. But again, two platters with slightly blue discoloration on them and one with a much whiter glaze and production in the ironstone. So some clues there. First things first, go straight for the one with the lovely mark and let's start looking that up. Well here is that uh, China mark in far more detail. S, B and S with a blue lion with a pennant in a belt mark. You can see the belt buckle just there when we uh, talk about a belt mark, the round uh, outer aspect of this mark is referred to as a belt mark. Now S, B and S is quite often uh, mistaken for Samson, Bridgewood and Son, but this actually isn't one of their marks at all and very helpfully Steve Burks on the Pottery's website has put a, a link and an example of this mark. This is actually a mark of Samuel Baker and Sons from the Don Pottery in Yorkshire and this mark was used between 1839 and 1848. You can find no reference on any of the websites to that little impress mark being uh, a date mark that's recognised or recorded. So straight away we've got a date and a manufacturer for platter number two. And there she is again in her full glory. I'm going to leave the wire rack on this because uh, these size platters do lend themselves to hanging as wall decorations in rows as well as dresser pieces and uh, you can't basically put that wire rack on and off without uh, actually plastically bending the metal so it's very difficult to put it back on. Now let's have a look. I'm moving back to platter number one. Okay, no factory stamps or marks anywhere on this piece as you can recall but what we do have let me just get it really in focus, is a partially impressed crown mark. Now, I've Google lensed that and it really isn't particularly helpful. Um, it's come up with a few ideas, but nothing that's uh, specific to a piece of ironstone or china. So in this instance, I've had to go away and do quite a bit of research online for information about potteries making ironstone in the sort of mid-Victorian period which were using impressed crown marks and luckily here we've got it turned back over there was only one that was making ironstone of this nature that uh, was using that impressed mark and that was Thomas Fell now this was not a Staffordshire pottery again but a, a Newcastle pottery at the St Peter's pottery and they were operating with uh, impressed crown marks for a relatively short period of time between 1869 and 1890. So with this one we can be pretty confident. Uh, you can never be 100% because that crown mark again was used by uh, a couple of other producers but none of them producing blue willow ironstone. And the other thing about this platter which I should have drawn your attention to earlier is the sheer weight of it. It probably weighs <coughs> somewhere in the order of around four kilograms compared to the other two which are probably two and a half to three maximum. This is a really substantial and heavy piece of ironstone and uh, again that ties in with the Newcastle production at this time. So that just leaves platter number three and here she is. No china marks, no manufacturing marks, no impress marks. A white glazed piece of uh, ironstone as opposed to a sort of bluish tins in the glaze used in the other two. So what elements of this pattern can we use to try and identify who the manufacturer of this uh, piece of ironstone was and the dates that it was produced? Well this is where things get really interesting. What I'm going to do now is start stacking these platters to show you close up some of the variation in these designs. Okay, now, unknown, unnamed, unmarked platter number three. Two birds, 
very distinctive, aren't they? Compare those to the fell piece. See the difference? Quite marked. It's very difficult to do this, but let's just see if we can do this slightly differently. Okay, now look at the shape of the tails, the heads, the openness or closeness of the beaks, and the way that they've uh, aligned the two birds and the pigment used in the actual colour. Thomas Fell, unknown platter number three, and the Samuel Baker. Very different, although the basic elements of the pattern are all the same. They are very different interpretations of the lovebirds. The next little bit we're going to look at is uh, this element, the upper block of temple and trees and islands. This is the, uh, the baker piece. Note the quite small interpretation of the distant tree and the way they've uh, put the island detailing in with these wavy lines on the bank. So that's the baker piece. Unknown, unnamed platter number two. Look at the quite clear and distinct markings on these tree leaves, if round dots. Again, the tree at the back, much more defined branching and uh, um, foliage in the background. And also the clear demarcation of the, the temple detailing here, much clearer, much brighter. And again, if you look at the island detailing, with the lines we've gone from four lines or three lines on the baker to just two areas of block work on this one and then let's just uh, compare that to the fell piece here we are very similar in the tree foliage design in the middle two trees with the the circular dots the temple design far larger roof in relationship to the detailing on the uh, the pinnacle or spire at the top with a much tighter roll and the tree again, much more defined, much more block work pattern, colour cobalt used in the, the lines along here. And just look at the detailing on the island, much more uh, irregular lines, three of them going down. So great variation in the, the pattern design that they've used on all three of those little areas of this single pattern. Now let's have a look at the ferryman. This is the Baker piece, again, quite... Uh, indistinct those the the elements that we're going to draw your attention to here are look at the the, the guy with the punting pole in the front of the boat and then the the mast on the boat with the the lantern on the top just look at the difference between the baker piece the detailing on the unknown platter number two for just the clarity and print definition far greater um, one, two, three, four ropes going up to the, the top of the mask on this boat and some block infill. Do you see this little bit of design in here where they put this hashing in to, uh, again, give the pattern more definition. So that's on the unknown piece. And here's the same boat on the Thomas Fowl piece. Again, a little bit of hashing in here. Much longer boat, much flatter with uh, far less curvature on the front and rear. So you're starting to get a feel for just the variation in these elements of the pattern and by focusing right in on these uh, elements within the Blue Willow pattern and uh, using the AI tools in your hands right now through Google Lens, you can start using these basic elements within the pattern to help identify and find matches of uh, similar listing or photograph pieces out there on the internet right now. Now I'm going to give you one more example of how that can be useful. Just look at these trees used on the, uh, the fell piece. First off to draw your attention to one, two, three, and a fourth branch coming out on the main tree behind the main temple. And then look at the temple itself, again with the hash work and design used on the, the roof and the trees, very different to what we're about to show you, but also coming to the right hand element of this pattern, just look at this tree here behind the tree in front. In some elements this isn't used at all and the temple and the design of the infill behind that. So that's the Thomas Fell piece. Compare that to the unknown manufacturer of platter number two which is three layers of uh, foliage on the main tree behind the temple. Very different design on the the actual temple with the roof 
infill and block work quite different shape in this central section on the top of the pagoda very different to the the thomas fell and look where that tree was before completely gone just the block work and brickwork of the pagoda behind it on this example and again very different design used in these little mossy islands in the foreground and again on the baker piece we've got just two branches or layers of foliage on the main tree behind the pagoda same shape in the uh, infill on the, the little bit of pagoda but the roof design everything quite distinct when you start breaking this pattern down the uh, moss islands quite similar in design again but the tree foliage on this one just look at that if I scan back onto the uh, the unknown piece you see the variation in that design with those round balls on the piece used by the Don Pottery very much more subtle those little round balls used to fill in the foliage so some fine examples there and by using those and trying to find examples on the internet we're going to try and identify platter number two from its elements so I'm going to do that using my Google Lens facility I'm looking to match the shape of the bird's wings and design I'm looking at that block work of pagoda with that particularly the roof design here to find an exact match I'm looking for something that's got the same shape boat with the very marked curvature in it I'm also looking for the absence of that big tree behind these areas here the pagoda shapes the infill all the blocks the number of uh, lines of foliage used on that uh, tree in the main block of pattern and by putting all those together you can start to match on the internet for the hundreds of graphics that have been posted over the years of blue willow platters now a caveat that we're going to give it's very important that when you're using this technique to try and identify that you are looking at similar size platters because even within a production facility or a factory the block design or transfer design that was being used will vary between the different sizes of the platters it's quite normal when you look at a graduated set of these when you get one through that the uh, block work is not identical on all of them so that is the one caveat for using this technique but uh, if you can find and measure these platters and then you're looking on the internet for matches for an identical size and shape of platter then you won't go far wrong so where did I get with all that well I looked at the birds I looked at the ferryman I looked at the temple elements key element in identifying this one was actually this block work here with the main temple with that particular quite characteristic element in there and the roof structure and the lack of that tree but also we found very useful the alignment of the shadow or path pattern coming down here and all of those by putting them all together led us to identify this as being produced by Alkin in Staffordshire somewhere in the date range 1860 to 1880 so a piece of Staffordshire and the colour the white background colour as opposed to the two blues on the uh, the Newcastle and the Yorkshire piece again tie this in with it being Staffordshire so three platters Staffordshire 1860 Samuel Baker Yorkshire 1840s and Thomas Fell Newcastle again 1860s to 1880s I bet you're dying to know what they're all worth aren't you well let me put you out of your misery the one we struggled with for so long and took such a lot of research to identify the piece of Staffordshire the Malkin piece um, the least valuable of them all because it's the most commonest and also it does have a slight staining here on the surface which does detract from its value condition with these pieces is everything value of this platter in today's market is somewhere between 100 and 150 pounds they are not that uncommon and can be found even in this size relatively easily um, going for it is basically its size the condition of the glaze and the fact that it's got its original or antique wire rack on it the Samuel Baker piece in beautiful condition incredibly rare difficult to find 
uh, real one for connoisseur collectors these and some people will just want to specialize in Yorkshire based pottery try finding another one of these for sale currently on the internet and I feel you will struggle in today's market this is worth between 350 and 450 pounds and the final piece the largest of the three and perhaps in the finest condition considering this is 1860s again the Thomas Flower Newcastle piece incredibly heavy incredibly rare difficult to find and this is a fine example of one in its original antique wire rack in today's market again this is worth between 400 and 650 pounds in this condition so there you have it a story of three fantastic platters on the face of it all very similar and to the undiscerning eye may be identical but when you start breaking it down you can see those various elements in these beautiful pieces of antique pearlware can help you identify where they came from, how old they are, and of course, very importantly, what they're worth. Thanks for watching.